Hello, I'm Renate Dohmann. I'm a lecturer in modern and contemporary art at the Open University. And I'm Kathleen Christian. I'm a senior lecturer in, uh, in art history at the Open University, specializing in Italian Renaissance art. I work on uh, issues of gender in relation to women. I also have a, an interest in, the, uh, interest in the global in terms of contemporary art, but also in terms of questions of empire, in particular the British Empire and there our work on uh, British India. And what kind of unites all these research areas, or one term which is really essential for working on these topics, is the concept of essentialism, which is what we're going to talk about here today. And I've brought a few props to talk about this today. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to have a little conversation about what essentialism is about. And at the most basic level, of course, it's what we associated with somebody's essence, or it, we refer to it as an inalienable quality. So it's inher the thought is that it's inherent, it's inborn, it's natural, in inverted commas, of course, quite often. And so it, the idea is it, it sort of can't be changed. So, for example, I think it, the origin in Western thought is classical philosophy, uh, where things are de defined by their essences. And maybe an example we can think of is apples and pears. So apples can be red, they can be green, but they're round and they come from apple trees. Um, pears come from pear trees and they have a pear shape. So those are the essential qualities that for us would differentiate an apple from a pear. That's a great example um, because with the apple, you know, you, you know you, as you mentioned, it has different colors, but it's always going to be an apple. So the essential aspect of the apple is not the color, but it's something to do with the shape, the taste, and where it comes from, the apple tree. And so this is an idea of, of an essential quality, but when we apply it to people, it's mm. a lot more problematic. And first of all, one obvious way it's been applied is in relation to gender. So this idea, for example, that women can't drive well, and it's sort of supposedly inherent in the different nature between men and women, um, of course, is highly problematic. And in a similar way, notions of essentialism, which really became very powerful in the 19th century, were applied to cultures and to mm -hmm. nations, because nations were defined or thought to be defined at the time by a shared culture. So every so the idea was at the time that every member of that particular culture was considered to be part of this essential nature of a culture. So if you are a British painter, let's say, and of whatever period almost, whatever you paint is essentially British. There's a British expression right. in it. So this is sort of how essentialism was applied to culture and this is where it becomes relevant to art history. It is very relevant to art history and you've, you've provided an image of the plan of the National Gallery in 1905, which I think is a good illustration of how people thought of cultures as being separate and having essential identities, that paintings represent those different cultures. They're the, uh, the illustrations of the essential properties of those different cultures. Exactly, and this is why they were organized in national schools, as you see on this floor plan. Obviously, these ideas have been criticized now. They are no longer commonly assumed to be valuable or uh, they're not being used anymore in the humanities. Um, nonetheless, these histories linger, so there are still these arrangements of art in a lot of museums by national school, for example. Um, and I've brought another illustration. There's a watercolour, um, which is now in the British Museum, by a 19th century artist called Stefanov. And he highlights, again, 19th century thinking about this essential idea of, of cultures have unique, inalienable characteristics which they all share and because this was thought to be expressed in the arts the idea was that you can look at the art of a nation and can rank them according to development and this is what we see in this watercolor so if you look closely you can see um, Greek art is at the top in the sort of pediment area then you have Egyptian art in the middle and at the bottom is Indian art and Mexican art and this is not and this is expressing this idea of a ranking of culture which is possible or was thought to be possible in the 19th century based on the idea 
if you look at the art, the art expresses the culture, the cultural essence, the national essence of a people. So you look at the art, you can rank it according to hierarchy. So that was a very important thought. So you have the concept of paintings from a particular nation representing the essence of that nation. But how is the concept of essentialism used when you talk about cultural encounters or cultural mixings? And how do the eggs that you've brought in relate to this concept? Oh, excellent question. This is where these guys come in. Um, I thought these exemplify the idea of essentialism really well because you have this cultural core or the, you know, the egg yolk and then a bit around and it's, it's a definite shape. From a 19th century point of view when essentialism was really the way to think about the world, what happens when you have some cultural encounter? The eggs, <laughs> yolks don't mix with each other, they stay solid and so, yellow. So the idea was, of course, if you make a scrambled egg out of it, which would, which actually is what happens, you know, when cultures encounter, you learn from each other, you adopt certain ways. Mm -hmm. But so, so from a 19th century point of view, that was dangerous because you'd lose your essential national characteristics. And so, so you don't want the scrambled egg. You want to keep them all in a fort a lot more. So, so this would be the idea of the global in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. You have these distinct units and they don't overlap, they don't mix. Mm -hmm. It also means from a 19th century point of view and an art history point of view, if you want to be an artist and you want to be famous or you want to be recognized, you have to stick kind of with your national tradition. Of course, I work on empire, I work on British India. So that means British artists were not interested in looking at Mughal art or Indian art and, and trying out some of the styles because that would be scrambled egg. It's in the, from an essentialist point of view, you, you have to stick to your essences. And so, so the, the encounter happens at the periphery and it can't ever be more than the periphery because the whole notion is based on, on essentialism. Um, and whereas now, of course, we're looking at the world very, very differently. Um, I, for example, work on, on the, con you know, on, on the transcultural. We exactly where we are looking at these instances of encounter, and of course, they've happened all along uh, throughout art history. And you work on the global, so uh, global in the Renaissance. So there are many, many examples where you know these exchanges have happened. They have enriched cultures. So it's actually so essentialism is is a way of thinking about culture which doesn't represent the actual thing that happens. What happens is the scrambled egg, scrambled. if you like. Yeah, and all kinds of whatever, omelettes and all <laughs> kinds of dishes with all kinds of additions and spices and so on. And so this has been a great move in art history to do, you know, as you're well aware, to do the global, which means to show all these elements in art where these exchanges have happened and it's been very enriching and you as a specialist on the Renaissance, you are very, you know, you obviously know how global the Renaissance, for example, was. Right. I think um, <coughs> if you look back on the traditions that have seemed to be essentially Italian, for example, Italian Renaissance painting, one of the shifts in, in art history in the last, let's say, 20, 30 years in particular has been to see that Italy was always a place of trade, exchange with other cultures, and the Italian Renaissance was shaped by contact with um, the, the, the Islamic world um, and also uh, all sorts of um, ideas that were transmitted through um, the translation of Arabic, uh, for example, science was changed. Mm -hmm. So to talk about the essence of what Italian national identity is, you get this scrambled egg. It's mm -hmm. always been a mixture. And of course, this idea of essentialism is integral to, you, to conceptions of Eurocentricity. So post-colonial, decolonial thinking is very much along these lines. Um, I just wanted to get back also sort of to show some more examples mm -hmm. to think about. So because of this idea of essentialism, artworks which showed a degree of cultural exchange or, or any kind of artifacts and objects were, of course, from a 19th century point of view, not of any interest, and they were also not representative of the purity of any culture. So these objects wouldn't be collected, they wouldn't be shown if they ended up in collections. And one example here is this 18th century Chinese bowl, so-called export art. If you look at this bowl, you can see it's obviously made in China, it's made for the European market, 
And as you can see, it's got some European musicians and some Chinese musicians. So uniquely, both cultures are actually represented. And if you look, there are small vignettes, these kind of medallions, and they show uh, Chinese landscapes. So mm. this is a wonderful example of the kind of export art that was commissioned in huge numbers. It was shipped to Europe and the United States and was sold there, but it wasn't shown. Yeah, it's only relatively recently that mm -hmm. uh, objects like that have surfaced. Another shift has been the way in which we look at canonical works of art that have been seen as the Western core. And if we look at this portrait by Rembrandt, for example, you see a man in oriental costume. Um, and that in the past might have been seen as sort of a representation of the Western tradition with a bit of exoticism added onto it. Um, but if you consider this outside of the concept of essentialism, you might see it uh, as um, representative of a culture that is encountering the East. And it has a real a meaning inside the Western tradition because it's not just an exotic add-on. It's created by the fact that the Dutch are trading with the East and they have this kind of relationship that has entered into the Dutch identity. All our examples um, are, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious they're not 19th century because this sort of work would less likely have happened in the 19th century when essentialism became really dominant as a thought. In the area of painting, there's another example I'd like to talk about. And again, it's telling, it's an 18th century uh, example. Uh, what we're looking at is a painting by Zoffany, also attributed to an Italian artist called Rinaldi, and it's of Major William Palmer in the period of the East India Company in British India. And you can see him here as if it's, this is a family portrait. So he married a Mughal princess. And you can see there's this really loving engagement and they are painted in their respective kind of clothing. So he's got his European outfit and she's got her Indian outfit. And, um, and it's shown as a, as a loving family unit. A, a, a painting like this would not and was no longer produced uh, and wasn't possible to produce in the 19th century when these ideas of essentialism became really uh, strong and became the way of looking at the world and this kind of cultural encounter where you have in, within a family this kind of real cultural mixing was no longer considered um, desirable. Uh, for the very reasons that we get, we would get our scrambled egg.